All right, so yeah, it's great to kind of see everyone here. Um, this is my first uh, time in Tel Aviv. I've actually had a pretty good time so far. I'm, I arrived late Saturday night, um, and I'm still kind of recovering from jet lag because it was a super long f flight from SF. Um, and uh, I've been treated to really good uh, sort of food so far. I've been to Minan, I believe, if Harel, if I'm saying that correctly, Minan. And I had this amazing cauliflower sandwich. Um, it came with some sauce. And I thought this was like, was like the best thing I've ever had, but I realized it was just tahini. But in SF, it's just, <laughs> it's just not, it's not the same. So, That's how it's sold. yeah, cool. Um, so yeah, so my my talk is a sort of um, on a, pa a path to effective data collection. And I sort of tweaked it a little bit um, when I first kind of started working on these slides. I realized that we are building some really cool, um, good practices in our data platform. And I wanted to add some slides about that. Okay. Um, Okay, so yeah, so I'm Willie. Uh, I'm a data engineer at WeWork. Um, I'm, on the, I'm on the project, the Marquez project, on the data infrastructure team. So the Marquez project is an open source proje uh, project that we kicked off about two months ago, and it's around metadata. So capturing metadata uh, about the data sets that we're data sets that we're producing and consuming um, at WeWork. Um, and I'm on Twitter, so if you want to follow me, that that'd be cool. So what, what this talk is about, uh, so as an organization sort of grows, the shape of the data um, constantly changes. And it's not just enough to capture the data in a reliable way. Um, you also have to think about uh, sort of the, how the data over time uh, changes. And the, the full story, um, so what's the full story of the, the sort of data, data collection? Uh, these, these slides aren't, uh, it's a PDF, so. Oh, sweet. OK, thank you. Uh, so the core idea is sort of if you want to create a healthy data ecosystem, you need event schemas. And you also need metadata about the data sets that you're, you're creating. Um, so why is this important? Well, for WeWork, we actually are acquiring a lot of companies. And we're, uh, we're also um, innovating on how we sort of take over the, the office space. Uh, so we have a product called WeGrow, which is kind of focuses on, on sort, of, uh, sort of children and sort of having them uh, sort of learn, you know, we're sort of like more like kindergarten and sort of focus on early ch early childhood. But most important one is sort of meetup, where we kind of meet up, we incorporate WeWork space. So if you're going to host a meetup and you need space, uh, you'll be able to kind of choose a WeWork space that's available, which is kind of a pretty awesome integration. Um, so what does data collection look like in practice? So I think. You know, every the initially you have a service and it, ha it has some sort of functionality. So that you define like a contract, a client, and a service. Uh, so far in our case, you could think about it where we have room bookings. So it's very important for our members to book a room. Uh, so the service here, for example, is going to be room bookings. And the important part is that you need data, so you need to store that in a database. And of course, over time, you kind of want to run analytics on the data. So. But your first, your service has an SLA, so it needs to be highly available. And you also need to process transactions with low latency. Uh, so that then you kind of run ETL jobs on the, on the data set itself, uh, the database. So you, you kind of want to know, well, on average, how many bookings do we do a day or weekly? And as you have ETL jobs that are processing that data, it's going to touch a few tables. Uh, so that's a bottleneck. So if you have your service that's hitting the database, it's locking it, and then you have these sort of concurrent transactions happening at the same time, that's a problem. Um, so the concerns are sort of that you have analytic queries that are of, often expensive. So usually if you're doing analytic reports, you, you kind of want to do, you, you want all these sort of dimensions. Uh, you do large scans on the data set. So use a service, you're, a service just kind of writing um, while we're with, with analytic queries that are ad hoc. They're, they're a little bit more complex, a lot more joins. And that's when you kind of see performance de degradations. Um, so what can you do instead? Uh, you could actually don't have the ETL jobs actually hitting the database directly. And you could start capturing the logs from the database. So what, what records are being inserted? What, what records are being updated? And you could capture all those changes in an event stream. Um, so how can we collect these events reliably? I think everyone. For the most part, I kind of heard about Kafka. And Kafka is just sort of a pub sub model where you have topics, which is a channel that allows you to send messages back and forth, um, or just a reliable way to communicate um, between a producer and consumer. So the producer is going to create the messages, and the consumer is going to consume them. 
Um, it's a fast and scalable uh, sort of uh, framework, and it's super durable. So durability kind of means replication. So with Kafka, you can set a replication factor. By default, it's just one, which means you're going to only have one copy. Uh, but you could actually bump it up to two, which means you have two copies of the data. So that's super important if uh, the data that you're capturing is maybe around payments or, in our case, room bookings. Uh, you know, that, that's really important to us because that's, the, that's uh, driving, driving a lot of our business. Um, so Kafka is great, but the one problem is, is that uh, the producer sends bytes and Kafka only knows bytes and the consumers as well only know bytes. So it kind of sucks if, you're com if your consumer is processing code and then sees an exception base because it didn't expect a field or um, it tried to deserialize de something that wasn't correct. And the only way you can kind of recover from that, so but wait, you know, Kafka isn't schema aware, you know, that that's kind of replaced or you know those type of checks can actually happen through a uh, confluent schema registry uh, so it's just it provides a rest api for uh, creating and retrieving schemas so average schemas are just a really good way to say this is what my data looks like so it tells you you know the fields um, what the types of the fields are it allows you to describe your fields and um, also allows you to version them so the global unique schema id is provided by the schema registry so every time you, you create a new schema or you want to register it, you get an ID back and it's global. So that means um, you, can start, you can start saying, okay, I have this, this sort of these bytes and they're Avro data, how do I deserialize it? You can actually get the ID and know what schema was used to, uh, to write it. So you have a version history um, at all times, which is also really good. Uh, so how does this incorporate with Kafka? So the producer writes Avro data, but before it actually does that, you know, it, it registers the schema. Uh, so it goes through Kafka, the Ever data uh, makes its way to the consumer as it's being processed, and now it could actually retrieve the schema. Uh, so, so what does WeWork's data platform look like? Uh, so we actually have a few key things that we care about. I mean, we're, we're going to use Kafka and we're going to use the Confluent, regi uh, Confluent regi uh, Schema Registry, uh, but there's one thing that we, there's a few things we do care about, and one is unified data collection, so a single entry point for data ingestion. So how does data get into our platform? You could, you know, if you could have it, you could have it in multiple ways, but ideally you want a single entry point, so that way you can kind of keep track of how data is getting into your system, and it's done in a sort of consistent manner. Um, so schema as a first class citizen, that to us is pretty important. So anytime data makes its way into our platform, we want to know the schema and uh, sort of who owns the schema as well. Uh, so that goes into access control. So if your if your application writes to uh, the uh, our event collector, we want to know um, sort of who owns it and eventually how it's going to be consumed downstream. Uh, so we want and we want to support batch and streaming use cases. So a lot of what we're doing now is the event collector will write events to a to a topic with the same name uh, and register to an app, and then it just uh, send the send the events to uh, our S3. So that way it allows for archival and allow you to do be, uh, uh, batch processing on top of that. And st same thing with use cases for streaming, because uh, these events, as they come in, you want to be able to um, uh, process events in real time. And the metadata as well, so that's the sort of Marquez project that talks about data lineage and fully self-service. So you don't want a team to be responsible for the schemas as, they, um, as the fields change, because that's kind of a bottleneck. Um, so you want it to be where the, the teams own the schema and they could evolve it, and then anyone upstream or downstream using the schemas uh, aren't really kind of aware of the changes. They could still, still pr uh, uh, process the data uh, if they know the schema that the data was written with. Uh, um, Oh right, right. So um, uh, it, there's a float that I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna go through, but it as the you want to archive all the events that are happening uh, that are being written to a topic in S3, uh, and that allows you and they're gonna be stored as Avro, so then you can start processing, uh, doing batch processing jobs on top of that. And why in S3? Uh, oh yeah, that, I'm sorry. Why in S3 rather than keep it in Kafka? Oh, uh, you know, in terms of retention, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, uh, for us, it just comes about, you, we do it for, you know, 30 days, and that comes with a cost, a storage cost. Uh, you can do it for a year as well, and it's, it's just kind of what you're comfortable with. Um, I think for us, we're looking at seven days, and then anything long-term. Do you know which uh, storage um, solution you're using for Kafka? Instant stores or EBS volumes? Okay, that's a good question. So EBS volumes, and we're actually using the Confl Confluent hosted uh, service for Kafka. Yeah. Expensive. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, 
build platform around data lineage. So uh, that was really important to us. So anytime you kind of walk into a company, uh, a lot of time you'll see data kind of being pulled in from a cron job from some external API, making it into uh, your data warehouse, and no one really owns it. They don't know how it got there or who, who wrote the cron job originally. Uh, so data lineage gives you visibility into the access of your data. So who's accessing it? Why are they accessing it? Is, does it have PII information? Um, it, in terms of you could kind of look at transformations and joins that happen. So as your data uh, kind of goes through your, your, your jobs, there's a lot of transformations that happen to your data, and you want to, you want to be able to capture that. Um, and then you also want to know where your data lives, uh, so which data sets really matter uh, for, for your business. Um, and that's actually where Marquez comes into play. So we, you know, we, we kind of looked at different options that were out there, and there actually wasn't many for, metadata, for capturing metadata. So we, we kind of decided that we're going to kind of take the initiative and um, kind of provide a solution for, for, some, for something that's really needed in the open source community. So we, we have, it's fully open, I mean, it's open source from day one, which is kind of great. So if you go to the Marquez uh, project and start the repo, that'd be super cool. And the, it's really just a metadata service that tracks data lineage and data providence. So you know what jobs um, depend on what data sets. Yeah. So this is actually sort of the inspiration be behind the name of the project. So this is Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Uh, he is a Colombian um, novelist who wrote uh, 100 Years of Solitude, which tells a story of a multi-generational family over um, um, over a span of a few decades, and or actually more more than a few decades, but uh, you know that that story kind of talks about you know how um, you know about his, history and sort of capturing um, the well, I'm sorry, yeah, the it, just sort of the family and sort of how how they sort of progress over time. And we kind of took the same model for the, the naming the project because we kind of track how data is shaped over time. Yeah. Um, so. So from day one, we wanted to have, so for our self-service data pl uh, platform, we wanted to have uh, Marquez at the center and sort of a database which just represents the metadata that we're capturing. Um, so then that's when, so after you have the metadata layer, then you can start uh, actually capturing events. And for the event collector API, so we, it's a, sort of a completely global view. So all the schemas are registered um, to, through event collector, which just uh, kind of routes it to the schema registry. But we do some enrichment on, on, the, event, uh, on the event schemas. Um, so we want to standardize to make sure that teams are really considering uh, sort of the data quality. So they, you don't want gaps in data. You, want, you don't want fields that are optional to be explicitly made optional and things that are required uh, or fields that are required to be to be explicit, and think, and we require all fields to be documented. So every field uh, requires a description, and we do some enrichment um, as well. So we add event IDs, we add the host that uh, the event came from when the event starts actually uh, being sent. We have a history, so fully um, event lifecycle management on the events themselves, and it's uh, self-service. So we don't uh, for the data platform. We just we're, the data that's coming in is very opaque. Um, we just want to make sure we provide a platform that scales and allow the, the users or the teams that are responsible for the events and their schemas to manage that. Um, and we're working on a UI where it allows you know, someone to log in and look at the events that they have registered with the, uh, with the app, I mean with the event collector, and also just co copy and paste Avro schemas and just make back and calls to the event collector. So this is the actual flow. So in terms of event registration and collection, so you have an app. Um, in this case, room bookings that register as a room booking event um, to the event collector, and then behind behind the scenes, the event collector registers that schema. And if it's evolved, it will return back uh, version two. But if it's the first version, it will just return back version one. And then the app itself uh, could start posting up events. But the the blue dotted line is sort of after we reg register the schema for that event, we create a event topic uh, for that application in Kafka. Uh, so that way, the app could start posting up events direct, um, right away to that um, to that to that stream. Okay. Are the apps talking to Kafka directly? No, so that's completely uh, completely abstracted. So we the event collector has a number of SDKs, and internally we have a lot of Python applications. So uh, that was our main focus to provide an SDK for for Python. Um, and at that point, it's just sort of like, okay, let me register. So you, you'll have your Avro schema in your code, um, and then you start. There's a registration endpoint that you hit. You get a version back, and then based off that version, you send it along with uh, uh, with your event. 
So the the client the SDK actually uh, serializes the the event as Avro. The consumption side. Uh, the production side. Uh, so the app the the client. Yeah. yeah. So I'm asking about the consumption side. Mm -hmm. How does it look like? Oh, uh, with the consumers? Okay, yeah, so at, the, at that point, it's just, a, so we use Kafka Connect. Uh, so right now, we're just focusing on the, the archival piece, uh, but it still talks to the schema uh, registry directly. Um, so right now, so what the platform looks like so far is you have apps that connect to event collector uh, to send events, and then it's communicating metadata to Marquez. Uh, and then you have various event streams for that application, which just, you know, if it's room bookings or if it's a, you know, room booking canceled, all those get their own, their own streams. Um, and then you have applications that re are reading off those topics and storing it as Avro in, in S3. And we want to get to the point where we also um, have Avro, but then translate it to Parquet. Uh, so for more, a quicker lookup, so Parquet is columnar uh, data uh, uh, format for storing your data in columns. So that way you can do data projection. So you can think about a file that has five gigs, but you only care about, let's say, 10% of that. Uh, you don't really want to read the entire file, filter out what you need, and, um, and then finally process the data. So you want to limit how much bytes actually go over the wire. Um, and they're also reporting to Marquez sort of what data sets they consumed and also what data sets they, they've produced. Um, so Uh, okay, yeah, so the question was a sort of like example of metadata that we're capturing. I think that's what, um, for the most part, yeah, so there's actually a few things that we're capturing. One is sort of the job, and the job itself just has a job name and sort of the, we then create an ownership table, so who owns the job. And then the, from a job, you have another table for job versions, and that usually is mapped to like a Git SHA. That's kind of worth thinking about, and it has a description and also the names of the data sets. Uh, that it's consuming and producing. Yeah. And then from there, you have job definitions, which represents sort of the runs. So that's what we use to um, spin off jobs, jobs from. So it's not really doing any sort of scheduling. It's just sort of capturing metadata. And we're working on sort of finalizing the APIs to send the job, job information out. Is that oh, OK? Yeah? Uh, data lineage, what it looks like? Um, Oh, uh, um, actually, so it's, it's going to be both. So we, we capture the schema, it's sort of how it's changed. So you have initial data set version of a data set. And then at that point, when you add a field, that actually becomes a new, a new data set as you start capturing uh, new data for, for, that, for that schema version. OK, yeah, we, we, could, we could talk after. Because uh, I have a few more slides I want to I get through. All right, cool. Um, so the, the Event Collector API um, is actually written in, in Finch. Uh, so Finch is actually an open source project uh, that is built off of Finagle. So Finch allows you to uh, author functional HTTP APIs. Um, so it's a thin layer on top of Finagle, which I'll go into a little bit on what that is. Um, it just promotes really good functional programming styles. So it allows you to compose HTTP endpoints using Shapeless, which is another um, library for, uh, Scala, for Scala. And Finch also allows you to kind of author very simple and small um, sort of applications, which when I walk through an example, you'll kind of see what, what I'm talking about. Um, so shape, Shapeless is just sort of generic programming in Scala. It kind of adds an abstraction on top of tuples. Um, and it allows you to do set statically size, uh, size collections. So it, it kind of knows um, what the size of your collection would be, doing some sort of magic behind the scenes. And this is actually used pretty heavily in, in, uh, in Finch. So the, the one thing that we had so if, with, with Finagle, it's an extensible RPC uh, framework. It was open source at Twitter. So it does things like connection pools. Uh, so it allows you to reuse resources. So if there's an expensive connection you're making to databases, it's going gonna, it's gonna to keep that in a pool. Uh, failure detectors. So if there's some, some weird thing happening with one of the servers, um, it's going to take it, it's going to account for that. Failover strategies. So it's not going to route traffic to a host that's not healthy. Uh, load balancing, of course, and then back pressure techniques. 
Uh, so if there is a if there's a host that's being hit pretty heavily, um, or there's some clients that are, are sort of sending a lot of qu requests, it's going to account for that. Uh, so f some of the French abstractions, so it extends Finagle. Uh, so there's server, there's service and server, and we'll go into uh, a little bit more detail what those are. And then the main Finch abstraction is just endpoint. And that's kind of what you use to kind of build out, build out your API. Uh, so the service itself, I mean, this is kind of, I just pulled this from, uh, from the, uh, the Scala docs at this point. And so it's just a service. It's actually just a, excuse me, this is actually how, uh, if you think about it, it's just a service as a function. Uh, so you have a service that takes requests, um, uh, request and response, and at this point, it just returns back a feature of that, of that response. And it, it's with Closable, so it allows to, uh, you to close the resource and do any sort of cleanup there. And for the server itself, um, kind of like the same thing. We just have a simple, really, uh, it's a, so it's a trade, and it has a def for server. It takes an address and takes in a server. And that service factory is where, after you sort of build out your Finch endpoints, uh, where you're actually going to set. Uh, so you'll, you'll see an example of what that kind of looks like. With a listening server, so again, if uh, once this is actually um, once actually server terminates, it does it does sort of uh, clean up clean up of resources and uh, removes it, it kind of so when it, when the service comes up, it, it locks a port and when actually it terms uh, terminates, it's going to um, make that port available again. So here's a really simple example uh, of your API that extends a Twitter server, and we, we're not going to fill in the API piece yet. Uh, we're going to we're going to use Finagle for that, and you just have a main function. And you say, okay, HPE.server, give us some config. In this case, you're going to give it a stats receiver to know where to send your, your stats. And you're going to listen on port 10, I'm um, sorry, 8081, and pass in the API, which we haven't defined yet. And on exit, we're going, to we're going to close the server. And the next piece is sort of the admin HTTP server. And I'll show you what, what that looks like. But with Twitter server, you get a really awesome admin uh, sort of page that tells you a bunch of metrics on, on the JVM, the heap uh, information, so I have a screenshot of that. And here's sort of an example of endpoint composability in Finch. Uh, so you, in this example, we have a, we define like a, we define a get HTTP on a ping, and we're just going to return back OK. And then a health endpoint, which is also just going to return back OK, just some plain text. And we're going to compose them. We're going to do ping, health, and then do a to service. And that's what we, this API is actually what we would pass to um, so in this case, if we were defining it here, we would just pass it to, uh, to the HTTP server, and that you have two endpoints that you can hit. Okay. And this is the Finagle admin uh, UI portal. Uh, it, you just hit port 90, 90, uh, 9990, and it gives you a bunch of uh, information on the JVM, your application, how it's performing, uh, how many connections it has. Uh, so this is really useful um, when, you're, when you're trying to do sort of performance tests on, on the app. Uh, so, so la last slide, sort of like why we chose Finch. Um, it allows you to do Scala idiomatic sort of functional way of building HTTP uh, services. So it's using a lot of the best practices sort of libraries out there, like Shapeless and Circe for J uh, JSON serialization. Uh, it's well documented, and um, it, in our case, we we have a lot of diverse clients. So we wanted to expose an HTTP API. Uh, and to generate clients based off that. So we, we couldn't use RPC because at that point, we kind of had to really enforce that across the board. And the RPC is very good for uh, service to service communication. And if, you if your team or you own those services, but in our case, we just have uh, so, many, so many teams working on so many different projects. HP became the best sort of route for that. Um, okay, so that's sort of my talk, yeah. Um, and in terms of the Marquez project, so if you're interested, um, just check it out. Uh, I think there's a lot of really cool stuff happening there. And obviously, if you want to join WeWork, um, we're hiring, so um, in Tel Aviv. Yeah. So yeah, that's it. <laughs> cool. um, so yeah, any, any questions? Yeah. Um, could you talk a bit about how Finch um, benefited you, you know, compared to raw Finagle? Oh, yeah, so in, in my case, so my case, I was well, I joined the team a little, a little on the later side. So at the time, we I don't know how much time was spent on sort of experimenting, experimenting with Finagle. Uh, I mean, Finch, Finch in our case made sense because uh, the team wanted to expose an HTTP API. You can't really it'd be hard to do that with um, with Finagle, which is why they uh, Finch came uh, or was designed and worked on. Now, are you using any of the um, 
um, instrumentation features of Finagle and with like the Zipkin integration and stuff like that? Um, Actually, I, so I don't know, I, I wouldn't be able to answer that. So for me, I spent about two months on the event collector team, and then I moved moved to the pro, uh, Project Marquez team. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Okay, cool. Any other questions? Okay. All right, cool. Thank you, Willie. Yep, that was fun.